Have you ever sat around in your easy chair and wondered how does all this networking stuff work? Well, let's talk about it from the basics of making a telephone call. Think about if you were to call your brother, friend, mother, you would need to know their phone number. You already know their name, but you would need to know their phone number. So either you know their phone number, memorized it, wrote it down somewhere, or you could go to your favorite telephone book and look it up. Well, that's basically the same process that has to happen in the network in order for the communication process to start. So for instance, we start our favorite browser, Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Safari, whatever, and we type in a name like www.google.com. Well, what happens at that point? Well, prior to discussing this, we, we spoke previously about DHCP, how your device gets an address, gets its mask, gets its default gateway, that whole process. So this is once we know that information, now your your client PC, your desktop, your laptop, your iPad, your i this, i that, whatever, BlackBerry, any of these devices can now communicate. They have the information they need to be able to communicate off of the local network. So again, the process is you're going to send a DNS query. You type in www.google.com and we see that right there, first packet in the frame. We see it's going to send a query, DNS standard query. If we look in the middle, the detail window, we see it has a transaction ID that is referenced 312A. So that's how we know when we get an answer back it will have the same transaction ID because we see there are multiple queries. There's another query there for www.mnex.biz and if we look at that one, that one will have a different query transaction ID C403. So again easy to map those requests and responses together. But we started with Google. So we see 312A query and we see a DNS response down here and we see the transaction ID is 312A. It is returning an IP address of 173.194.64.105. So basically that's Google's telephone number. So now your PC, iPad, etc. can take your IP that it got from your DHCP server, takes that through its mask, it takes this address that it learned from the DNS server through its mask, and it is now up to your PC to determine is that host server on your local network. And in this case, we see the client's network is a 10 dot address, and Google's is a 173 dot address, so there's no way those two are on the same network. So what must happen is the client must send the sync request to the MAC address of the router in order to reach that particular server. And that's exactly what we see in the next packet. We see the client IP 10592674 send the TCP sync request, which is the equivalent of collect call from me, do you accept the charges, to the IP address that it learned from the DNS server. If we change our view here, we can see the MAC address that's coming from an Intel NIC, and it's sending that particular request out to an HP 09E5BD. So that is the MAC address of the router or firewall or whatever to get off of our local subnet. Usually that's your default gateway. Sometimes you're, if you're a small in-home network you have your router and firewall are the same devices. So we see the sync request being sent. We then see a sync ACK being sent back. Oop, that's a that's a different connection. Sorry there. We just jumped ahead there too far. There's our 105 sync request. 
And there is the sync act coming back from the server, Google server, saying it's willing to accept that connection request. And there's the act, TCP three-way handshake. So we could technically time how long that process took simply by changing our relative time on the sync request. And there is the final three-way handshake ACK. So we can see that that process took 38 milliseconds. Again, we now have a way to measure our network round-trip time.